Um, now, if you've joined our webinars over the course of the past few months, you know that it's always such a privilege for me to be able to introduce our speakers and chat with them. Uh, today, I have to admit, is the most personally exciting because I get to introduce my very dear friend, Megan Macaluso, who's here to chat with me today. Megan is the Senior Director of Customer Success Strategy and Transformation at Conversant by OneTrust. She has spent her career delivering meaningful customer moments and interactions, including during her time at ServiceSource and here at ESG. Uh, one of the reasons that Megan and I really wanted to talk about this particular topic is because of that work that we've done together during our time at ESG together. Um, we've, we've executed workshops like this for several ESG clients over the years. And, you know, we really wanted to be able to share that knowledge. We know there aren't a ton of CS leaders out there who have done this a lot of times before, and we're lucky enough to have had the opportunity, you know, to do this together quite a few times. Uh, so we really just wanted to share our expertise and our knowledge on this topic. And Megan, I know this is something you're going through with your team right now at Conversant. So really, really excited to have you and excited to chat about this. Well, that is a lovely introduction. Thank you, Marley. Yeah, I'm, I'm like super pumped to share this. Um, and I know the goal is for people to be able to walk away uh, and go have these sessions, right? And so um, again, do ask questions. Um, any follow-up afterwards is more than welcome. Like, but yeah, as Marley stated, like coming up with how we design um, and execute these sessions and then get that real work in front of customers is, um, is, is really fun. So I'm looking forward to doing this today. Awesome. Um, so give me one moment here to share my screen with you all. I promise I will get slideshow going. Uh, real quick, I did see a note that my audio was not coming in very well. Is, is everybody having an okay time hearing me? Yeah, let us know if that's better for you in the, in the audio. Okay. Awesome. Right. Perfect. Sorry, guys, I have too many screens going on. One second. <laughs> Megan, you know how that is. I do indeed. Awesome. Um, so... I'm gonna go ahead and share. See the slideshow? Yes, ma'am. Fantastic, here we go. Um, so let's let's jump right in. Um, you know, Megan, you and I talked a lot about kind of, like I said, the purpose of this topic, why a CS leader would want to even hold a design session like this. Um, so let's kind of start there. Talk to talk to everyone out there about why someone would want to be doing this, kind of what the purpose is. Uh, so generally speaking, one of a few things are happening, right? Either it is the first time um, that a team is trying to reach their customers through digital channels, right? So um, recognizing um, through email, through in-app notification, um, through your knowledge base, there's so many ways um, that our customers can be reached. And I think we've all recognized that digital capability to do that is becoming more and more important over time. Um, and so if you don't have something like that in place, having these very early conversations of what you might want your first iteration to look like is huge. Um, it might be that you're revisiting something that was built a long time ago. Um, Marley and I had lots of conversations around like digital sequences need constant revisiting, maintaining, review as products change, as your customers change, as your tool stack changes, right? Like any number of things can be infecting your customer experience with your current digital um, sequence. Also, um, you should be sort of learning about the efficacy of your programs if you're running them right now, right? So are customers engaging with the material? Are customers exhibiting the behavior that you expect um, from what you're putting in front of them? So if those things are happening or not happening, want to have these on a fairly regular basis to, to understand how well your sequences um, are working towards your goals. Um, and because these things can't happen in a silo, right? So as an individual person or even as a small individual team, it is not a good idea to sort of put these things together on your own because you're probably missing really important perspectives from other customer facing areas within your organization. Um, so having a comprehensive workshop whereby there's a clear goal, there's a clear agenda, you have the right people coming um, and you understand what it is that you need to put together is really critical to having a successful digital program. Absolutely, you know, and something I think you and I have talked a lot about over the years is the collaboration that's required for something like this, 
right? So that's something we're going to focus on quite a bit today uh, throughout the presentation because we can't do it in a silo, right? We can't build digital or automated communications independently of other teams, other orgs, other people who are talking to your customers, all of that. So um, we'll be focusing on that. And we, you know, I think, like I said earlier, we just really want to make sure that this is, is practical and helpful uh, to everyone listening. So that being said, let's, let's jump in. So we talked a little bit, um, you know, about the holistic why of why you would want to implement digital CS. Um, but talk about sort of the more acute, the, the when and why, what different specific scenarios, you know, we have a bunch of examples laid out on the screen here, but maybe you can share some examples, Megan, um, for some of these. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so if we start with the new customer segment, right, this is generally where a business has reached a point where um, there's been a segment of customers that have identified where both the cost to serve in that segment and the customer experience is more um, heavily enabled through digital means, right? So um, as that bottom of the pyramid sort of section gets bigger and bigger, sometimes it's, you know, there's a there's an opportunity to, to make that slice through and kind of make those decisions around like, what is the right group of customers to have a more digital experience with your brand and with your company, right? Um, and so that is generally like a big starting point. Um, now that said, even though that is a heavily addressed market for digital, your um, enterprise segments and your mid-market segments can also absolutely benefit from digital touch, right? So the other place where you see this, right, it might not be a new segment, but if you look at your high touch segments where you've got you know, really um, focused one-on-one -on -one interaction is still a really good place to pass through really good thought leadership. Um, reach out to your executive leaders that maybe aren't as close to the business, right? So um, just in looking at each of your segments, it's really important to understand what the right engagement should look like from a digital perspective. Um, but certainly anytime you're building out a new segment and want to enable your customers through a digital means, you'll want to go through this process. Um, new products, man, this is a big, big one. one. Yeah. Big one. Because if you're doing any sort of like triggering or calls to action, right? So anybody that's on the call that's using, you know, different playbooks around, you know, when this happens, do this or like, hey, onboarding is going to be largely driven by the customer. We're going to use walkthrough guides. We're going to have like ways for customers to do things themselves. Every time you have a new product, there has to be a new workflow against that product. Um, and then if you have like stacks, customers that have like multiples of that, and those are interacting with one another, it's another thing to keep in mind. So always want to revisit your, um, your digital engagement when you have new products starting. And you can apply to new new product features too, right? Not, totally. not just an entirely new product line, but let's say, hey, we've you know changed the UI or added these five new features in a big release. Same kind of scenario. Totally. Um, and that is something that uh, on my team is, is something that we manage because you need to work closely with your product team, uh, with your sales team, with your CS team to understand like, what is the new feature? What do our customers need to be enabled? Um, and then how can we use this digital channel uh, to, to help support those releases? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, the next couple of things on here are around different phases in the customer journey, right? Um, Marley, you and I have worked on a lot of different onboarding um, flows. It's a really great time, especially if you don't have a ton of one-on-one -on -one interaction really early in the process to, to really lean on your digital capabilities to get in touch with your customers right away um, and to create that brand relationship and give first impressions, right? Um, and then above and beyond that, it's how can you leverage those channels to give them the, the ability to get into a knowledge base right away, to join a community right away, to know who their CSM is right away. Um, so lots of, lots of things that you can do with onboarding. Um, and then adoption as well. If you've got really good access to your data and you know what your customers are, are doing and you know what a, a solid adoption looks like from your end users, uh, this can be a really great opportunity to, to take that data and lift it out. Um, and then leverage your digital channels to, to support that activity. 
Absolutely. Another one, this next one on the list, this free trials or kind of freemium to premium is another thing we've seen a lot of. And in a lot of ways, it ends up sort of mirroring the onboarding and adoption uh, flows that you just talked about in sort of a, a mini version, right? Uh, ultimately, the goal is to convert from free to paid, obviously. Um, curious to get your perspective on that one in particular, because I think it's uh, something a lot of people are talking about right now. Yes. Um, and so I think two things like one is digital capability for free trials is generally necessary. Um, and the, I think the pitfall to try to avoid here is these customers don't have skin in the game, right? Like they haven't paid. Um, they may just be trying it, not really understanding what the level of effort is. And so leveraging, um, things like walkthrough guides, things like in-app notifications, things like email sequences, um, articles, all of that good stuff um, creates a really good experience for those customers, even though no one's speaking with them, right? And so as much as you can bolster that, because really what you're selling to, you know, free customers at the time is that they want to work with you in partnership yeah. as a business. Um, so it's not just about the features and functionality, but it's about that sense of like, oh, I do want to work with this company. I do want to leverage this solution. Um, and that actually takes a lot of forethought to do with this, um, this particular, uh, goal in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Right. And it, um, you know, it ties into the next few we're going to talk about, especially reducing costs to serve, Right freemium to premium, the whole point is convert from free to paid, make more money, right? Versus if you're looking at your CS team and you're like, oh my gosh, it is costing our business so much to service all of our customers. This happens a lot when companies grow really quickly. Um, you know, then the challenge there is like, okay, how do I make it more efficient for me to serve my customers? Yeah, absolutely. There's a point where as you're growing the cost line, needs to flatten out and come down a little bit, right? Um, and, and it's important because like being fiscally minded about your organization and still producing results at the same time is huge um, and paramount to having a, a successful organization. Um, and so, you know, but, and, and I wanna marry this to the next item here, which is improving CX. This is a yes and thing. We're going to reduce cost to serve and we're going to improve our customer's experience, right? Um, you don't wanna sacrifice the second for the first, right? So, um, and I would argue that met most of us, um, regardless of what we're working with, really like um, smart digital engagement and would likely prefer it over having to get on the phone. Uh, for certain things, right? And so how do you leverage your customer view, your customer voice? Like how, like how do you know the places where your customer will interact even better um, through digital means than through one-to-one um, -one interaction? Yep, absolutely. And the last one, you know, kind of is another way of saying both of the things you just said, right? You want to scale in order to reduce your cost to serve and to improve your customer's experience. Right, it's that it's that both, and and you don't want to sacrifice one from, for the other, and you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. You really can accomplish both in this way. All right, let's talk about how how on earth you go accomplish all of those things we just talked about, or any of those things we just talked about. It's the hard part, right? It is. Um, so we want to talk about you know establishing a goal and preparing an agenda for this design session that we're talking about. So Megan, talk everyone through how you think about preparing for that session and, and going into it. Um, yes, so the kind of the forethought in designing this workshop is important, right? And so what I would imagine is there's smaller conversations taking place going into this session um, because identifying what the goal is coming out of that room or off of that call, whatever it is, um, is going to be able to guide you to make sure that you're focusing on the right places during what is probably really valuable time with a lot of um, really important people. Um, and so going back to kind of the first area is, you know, what are we trying to achieve? Um, this can be anything from, you know, we need to create a really high level view of what we think the key touch points are in this digital sequence, right? So if it's something like onboarding, like there's been some decision made, 
somewhere that says, hey, we want to figure out how to do onboarding in a digital way for X segment of customers, right? Um, and if that process hasn't started at all, um, you're probably going to want to keep it to let's validate that what that experience needs to look and feel like, right? Um, or let's say you've been running a digital sequence and you, you're recognizing that some part of it is not working very well, right? Like maybe you launched your MVP, you're, you're doing kind of like revisiting the engagement and you're like, man, people are really interacting with this email and with this walkthrough guide, but this is what we're not seeing. You can really then narrow your view right? In a session where you're like, we're going to dig in deep on like every piece of this. We're going to look at the data and understand what's working and what's not working. Um, so there's really, there's some pretty big bookends with this. Um, but the critical pieces are know what segment you're looking at, know what your current tool capabilities are, um, know what your resources are. Uh, and if there is a potential that you're going to walk out of a session like this and need to go to your financial stakeholders and ask for more resources, like ask for a tool or ask for more CS operations um, resourcing or ask for content writers or ask for time with marketing, right? Like those are all things that you're probably going to need to get approval for. Make sure that is also one of your object objectives, right? Is to identify where you know this is the right path. Um, and then you need to quantify what both the benefit of doing that exercise is and then what resources you need so you can have that conversation with your leadership. Yep. Love it. Um, so Megan, before we, you know, talk in depth about what this design session should actually look like, we wanted to show people what the ultimate goal is that they would get out of conducting a session like this. So um, everyone, these are real examples that Megan actually just sent me that she's using for her team. So this is not for illustrative purposes only. This is, this is a real thing she's working on. Um, so Megan, talk us through this kind of self-start concept that you guys are, are using in your journey here. Yes. Um, so our business is growing very quickly. Um, and to just give a, like a very brief um, introduction. So Conversant does ethics and compliance software and solutions. Uh, so for companies that have whistleblowing um, objectives or have broader ethics programs, we have software that supports the intake of those cases, um, the management of those cases, the investigation of those cases, and then your ability to go and resolve a case. So if someone um, in your in the company needs to pick up the phone or send an email that's like something's going on that I, I don't feel good about. Uh, and especially like the bigger the company you are, like it's really important that like those are managed and they're coming through. So these are the kind of programs we're setting up with people. Some of our customers just need a really basic version of this. Like when you talk about the compliance piece, right? There's directives in Europe coming down right now that are like, look, this is like the where you need to be in your business, regardless of your size. You need to be able to have cases come in and you need to be able to investigate and solve them within a period of time, right? And so um, for those types of companies that are like, I need the most basic program in place, we wanted to create a self-start onboarding experience. Um, there, It's pretty simple. Not all customers need all things, right? Um, I remember being on a call actually when I was at ESG with a CS leader that once said, adoption is a fool's errand. Um, and in, in this case, like that is true. We're like, man, if we try to push every bit of feature functionality onto our more basic customers, like that's not a good experience for them and it's not what they want. Um, and so this year, over the past quarter, we've developed um, this new program. So this slide in particular was part of our communication. You might call it a roadshow internally. Um, so I did not build this, like people on my team put this together, but it's really all around, like how do we enable our customers to, to fish for themselves, right? So um, how can they go live faster? If they're leaning on a professional services team, right? Or you're leaning on a project manager, one-to-one -one interaction, it's going to take more time. So if we can give you everything you need and you can come online quicker than you would otherwise, it's a huge benefit to a lot of our customers, um, have the best practices built in um, and the option to further design their program on their own. So try to guide them through, here's your base configuration. Here's how you can get up and going and flip that switch. And then here are the ways that you can improve that over time. 
Um, and so on the right hand side are all of the different things that we built around this digital program. Um, so email sequences, um, a welcome packet, so a really comprehensive document that has everything that customer needs to know with all the links. Um, trainings, right? So we don't want to completely avoid any one-to-one -one interaction in a scenario like this. And so we knew it was important to have scheduled um, trainings and office hours with our technical consultants so that as people are setting this up themselves, who have probably never done this before, <laughs> have someone to talk to um, and get real live training from. Yeah. Um, our customer hub is a place where you can go to our knowledge base. And this is really where we're trying to drive a lot of things because um, there's so much rich content in the, um, on the knowledge base in terms of like video content, um, articles, thought leadership, like community interaction, right? So having a space that, that our customers can like bookmark and just go back to time and time again, anytime they have questions. Um, it was a really fundamental piece of what we needed to create. Um, and then the last piece is we do have Pendo as a solution. And so um, we've, we're really looking at, um, you know, leveraging, especially with this program, walkthrough guides. I mean, just um, a lot of our customers aren't technical. Right. I would imagine a lot of people on this call run into this a lot. You are a tech company working with end users who are not that technical, meaning if you're going to ask customers to do things on their own, uh, it needs to be presented in a way that's geared toward their level of thinking um, and resonates fully and is engaging so that those customers can actually do those things because um, it's not intuitive yeah. for them to do this stuff. Totally. And we I mean, even when you and I were working together, we ran into that a lot where it's like, hey, we have these non-technical end users that need to be able to use this product. And guess what? We can't invest in a million hours of one-on-one -on -one CSS, CSM time for those end users. And so this is the answer, right? Having every single resource that they could possibly imagine sort of available at their fingertips and in a place that they know where to go. Yeah. And I think one of the, um, one really good thing to identify is you're kind of understanding what, you know, where these places are where you can leverage digital is if you're going to ask a customer to do something. Um, it needs to be valuable to them. So what you kind of, what you want to measure is for every kind of stage of the thing that you want to happen within your digital communication, um, that you want your customers to interact with is like, is the value and the level of effort that they have the right balance? Um, because if a customer has to do a lot and it's confusing and they don't feel a lot of value from that moment in time or from that experience, they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so really understanding and keeping your eye on that is very important. Yeah, so true. Um, we have seen maps like the one I'm gonna show everyone in a second that actually have like a happier, sad face yep. next to every single step, right? Uh, which is a really great way to, to measure that and think about that. What are they getting? Is this hard for them? Is this easy for them? Are they gonna be happy about doing this or are they gonna be mad at you <laughs> for making That's them? right, yeah. Um, Uh-oh, I think my other slide did not come through. Well, we'll uh, I'll get the example. Um, in a minute, but let's talk about preparing for the session. Sure. Um, and so going, I think going back to the original slide too, is you're probably yeah. like, well, all right, so who all needs to be there? Um, and how long is a session like this due to take? Uh, so, you know, I'm sorry, my corgi is barking in the background. So <laughs> you're welcome. I don't know if anybody can hear him. Um, so some of the key considerations, right, are one, the, the cross-functional nature of your audience, right? So um, someone, ob you know, obviously the parts of your team that are familiar with the tooling that you're expected to use, people that know the customer segment that you're working with really, really well. Um, and then anyone where this is going to like impact other organizations, generally speaking, someone from marketing is in the room um, because again, like that brand consistency between you know, what marketing and like, you know, revenue is doing needs to, you know, feel consistent with 
the type of brand that you're presenting through your own digital communication. So having someone from that realm is really critical. Also, they know how to do this stuff really well. Like a lot of the methodologies and the tools that run like these digital components um, were developed for marketing purposes initially. So this is a, these are very different use cases, um, but having good smart marketing people around for this is always a really good idea. Um, if this is gonna impact your support team, bring them in. If you're going to change things in your knowledge base, if you're going to change things in your training, um, if your customers are going to be onboarding themselves, for instance, guess what? They're probably going to call support more. So um, if the the if the thing that you're doing is impacting um, another organization, like make sure they're there at some point. Uh, and then if you, ha if you have like an executive um, sponsor, right? So whoever, like whatever leader that's there that is like collaborating with you and is going to help you move this initiative through the organization. Um, you know, it's sometimes good to have those people in the room and maybe not for the whole day or whatever, but like have them there for sort of critical parts of it or for a readout at the end or whatever that is. Yeah. Um, the other one we talked a little bit about earlier is, is product, right? It's so helpful to have someone from products there, right? Especially if we're thinking about, hey, what do we need to know about you know, this new feature that's being released, what do we, what considerations do we need to keep in mind as we're building this, uh, whether it's, you know, an entirely new product or, or features and functionality yeah. like we talked about, or just other things that product has on their roadmap that can sometimes, unfortunately, still come up as surprises to CS teams. Um, if you're going to build something like a, a digital program, really, really extra important to know about those things and, and have them involved in these conversations. Oh my gosh, 100%. And I would add to that two things. One is that if you're doing in-app notifications, you're basically changing the UI of the, the product. Yeah. So if, if product doesn't feel good about that, like that's going to that's gonna be a challenge. The other element is like, if you're getting a new tool, right, or you're going to start to, you know, connect in your user data, like, that is going to require IT. It'll require like product to know what's going on. Um, and what we do see like realistically is sometimes when there's product updates that are happening in the system, it can mess with um, kind of what you have set up from a technology level, right? And so working closely with those people to like know when that's coming um, so that you're prepared to, to uh, you know, deal with that um, proactively instead of you know, having angry customers call you um, is, yeah, it's critical. Yep. Yep. Um, you know, and then those resources that you were talking about earlier, right? Like who is available? What technology is available? What, who and what do you have at your disposal to even do this with? Really important to think about that before you go into your design session. Yeah, it's going to be a lot more rich um, if that if some homework is done by people, so they're walking in kind of ready to talk about what it is that you're putting together. Um, and so, yeah, those one-on-one -on -one conversations with the people that are going to be there are really important. Kind of make sure, like, having your if you're facilitating, having your head around what everybody is like armed with, walking into the room. Um, I would also say, you know, have the skeleton um, built like the, the spine of what you're going to be building from a, like a framework perspective prepared to a certain degree. So things can always move around on a journey map. Things can always move around on like a service delivery structure. Um, but coming with some sort of like key areas that are like, well, here are the different phases. Here are things that we know need to happen along the time from, a, you know, when the customer signs to the time we say a customer has onboarded, for instance, like come with a little bit of that um, and things can always move around, but it gives you a better starting point than like starting from scratch um, yeah. in the room. Totally. All right. So we've prepared for the session. We've thought about all the pre-work, all the pre-homework that needs to be done. Now, okay, it's session time. What do we do? How do we do it? All right. So, um, I mean, traditionally this is like really fun in a room, uh, but that is hard to do now. Um, and, I, and I will call out um, Marley and a handful of other folks that are on the ESG team. Um, and I like to bring up this example because it was one of my favorite like days of planning that I've ever had. Um, we had people that were sick in that room. We had people that were on a red eye to get to this meeting for us to go to Philly um, with one of our 
you know, with one of our favorite customers um, to build out, a, you know, this digital workflow. Um, but we had all the right people in the room. Um, and so I think the thing is like, whether you're in a room or you're doing it remotely, creating a really safe space for people to explore their ideas, right? Um, you don't want to stifle creativity or brainstorming in times like these, because like, that's where the good stuff comes out. Um, and if people don't feel comfortable, you know, calling out risk um, or bringing up creative ideas outside of the box, you're going to miss a lot of like really good stuff. Um, so my very first thing is like, once you kind of have your group together that you want to work with um, is, you know, whether it's again in a real room um, or you're going to do it remotely, like make sure that that kind of um, understanding is there. Um, from a tool perspective, um, there are a lot of really good uh, tools out there that are inexpensive and maybe even free that you can use to do this remotely. So um, Miro, M-I-R-O is one of my favorite tools. Um, Mural is another one. Um, oh, there's another really popular one, but there are lots of good uh, kind of whiteboarding tools out there that were built so that people could have these kind of like in real time um, conversations. The one thing I would say is if you're going to use a tool like that, make sure you've practiced a couple times. Um, sure a lot of time using it in in real time. <laughs> oh yeah, and like you, uh, yeah, because if you walk in and try to do this thing live and you know have things going in real time and you're not comfortable with the tool, it's gonna it's just gonna be icky, um, but they're generally pretty easy to use and have a lot of templates, um, like, oh, Lucid Chart, that's another one. So, um, but generally speaking, these tools have lots of templates, so you'll have something to start with, and then frame in your mind, like, again, like how you want to run that session. So if you're like, we're going to go from this point to this point, and we're going to walk through it linearly, or do we want to start as a group with just validating some assumptions about what's already here, right? So just be prepared know the tool that you're using and the flow that you want to have. Um, and then again, like earlier, like come back to those goals, right? So this is the goal and this is how we're going to get there. Yeah. And that tool can absolutely be a whiteboard and a marker, right? If you're in a room together or you have a conference room set up that one person is in that room and everyone can see, you know, see the whiteboard on their cameras remotely, you don't have to use a fancy tool. You know, they're great if we're all sitting at home in our home offices doing this. Um, it'd be a lot harder without them, but totally, if you do have the opportunity to get together or, you know, you have another setup can totally be a whiteboard and a marker. And sometimes that's the best. And lunch or something. Yeah. So that's the, I mean, like if you're, and, and that's something I wanted to come back to is like creativity, right? If you're going to give yourself space to like think and explore, it's better to have a little bit more time, right? And I think in a room, that's a lot easier just to keep people engaged. Like it's hard for people to sit in front of their laptop for hours on end to do this yeah. kind of stuff. Um, so if you have the opportunity and the luxury to bring your group into a real room with a whiteboard um, and you know, start with coffee in the morning and then order lunch in the middle of the day, keep people's blood sugar up. That's typically good if you're going to be in a room planning for a long period of time. Um, and yeah, this, this can be like fun and enjoyable and, and then can have like real results and impact at the end. And I've, I think I find that the more enjoyable the sessions are and the more creative and collaborative it is, like the better the outcome is going to be. Um, so however you can do it with whatever um, capabilities you have, uh, just keep that in mind. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I 100% echo what you said earlier. I know exactly what day you're talking about, exactly what session you're talking about, and ditto, it is one of my favorite working days of all time. Um, so these can be really fun, and you can come up with amazing ideas. And even if you can't go do all of those really awesome ideas tomorrow, um, that level of creativity is just invaluable in the room. And then that last piece, which is probably... I mean, I want to say it's more or less important. It has to be there, right? The customer experience, it can get really easy to get focused on your internal stuff, right? Like we can send this email and then we're going to do this and then we're going to do that, right? Like, it, and so, and then that is, I mean, that's your service delivery, right? Like that's, that's your internal, like below the line stuff. 
totally critical. Um, but more important is what is the moment? What is the touch point and the interaction with the customer along that timeline? And what are we trying to drive and how are customers supposed to feel in those moments? Right? So, um, if it's a first email, because some, you know, a customer has just signed, do you want them to feel excited? Yeah. Do you want them to like look forward and have momentum? Right. That's critical, um, to driving, um, engagement, right. Is like, how do you keep that momentum going? If you know, there's a, like a twingy spot in your flow. That's like, uh, like in order for them to do this thing, they're going to need to read some big, long article and they're going to need to come back and they're going to need to do this other thing. Like get that stuff written down because you can acknowledge like, Hey, this is a huge level of effort in this touch point. And my hypothesis is we're going to start losing people at a yep. certain point if that's how it looks and feels. And so getting that out and just being honest about what, what the customer is going to experience in that moment is critical. Yeah, I love the um, backstage and on stage metaphor for this. Yeah. Right, your service delivery is everything that's happening backstage. You know, at a play or a musical or a ballet or whatever you're seeing. Right, it all needs it all needs to happen. It's important. You need to think about the internal workings. But if you're going to see a show and only that backstage stuff is happening and nothing's ha actually <laughs> happening on stage, you're going to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The audience is going to be bored. Yeah. Be so, pissed they paid for a ticket. So. <laughs> yeah. So same thing for your customers, right? you got to think about both on stage and backstage, what they're experiencing and what you need to do behind the scenes to make them experience that. Totally. Awesome. So during the session... Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of tools we can use. Like a lot is going on, but what's really the goal here? How, do, how are we measuring success in a, a scenario like this? Yeah. So if, if you build a whole thing and you don't know how to measure whether it's working or not, like it's going to fall flat really quickly and it's going to be really difficult to get, um, good support from your leadership, right? To do a program like this for very long. Um, you need to be able to articulate whether things are working. And so um, the nice thing about digital is there's lots of ways to do that. Um, so obviously like, you know, if you're trying to increase customer adoption, let's say you're like, we've identified a cohort of customers that like, you know, aren't like their usage is below kind of a, what we like to see. Mm -hmm. Right. And so how do we like get them to a space where they're, they're using more functionality and you create some kind of sequence that says something like, okay, at these different points in time for this cohort of customers, we're going to introduce this bit of thought leadership. We're going to highlight the new features that are part of the tool. Like when they do log in, we're going to make a big deal about it. Like just what, whatever those kind of things are that you can put in place mm -hmm. to encourage your customer to see like all the value of your solution. Right. So your hypothesis is we're going to get all this stuff in um, and then your adoption metric will go up, whatever that is. Right. So, but that's, that's a later indicator. And then the one way after that, right, is whether they renew or not. Like ultimately you want your customers um, adopting so they see value and want the partnership and they don't churn, right? So at the end of the day, you wanna influence their renewal. And so taking a step back is, well, you want a higher adoption rate, but that could take time, right? That could take easily months to see the, the change in the behavior. So what can you track early to know whether the stuff that you're putting in place is working? And that's the really nice thing about engagement is you can see whether people are opening emails and whether they're clicking through emails and whether they're looking at the walkthrough guides. Um, if you have a pretty sophisticated setup, you can look at things like we did this, like these sequences um, of these steps that a customer needs to do. And we look in the, the tool itself and see if that's happening. Right. So can you correlate the things that you're putting in the tool with a change in the behavior? Um, so those are the kinds of things you want to look at early. Right. Because if you kind of just let an email sequence ride and you're not looking at whether people are opening it or getting it or it's meaningful to them, they're not going to get past point A to get to point B. Yeah. Um, and to an earlier point about, you know, if and when there are tricky or sticky or more challenging um, spots in the journey or, or things that customers need to do themselves, how will you know if they're getting past that point, right? Are they actually doing that thing that we know, oh, we know this is hard, we know it's frustrating, like whatever it is. How do you know if you're losing people there unless you're, you're measuring those kinds of metrics? And then there's, um, 
I saw Ed Powers on here, so I, I won't forget to mention this. Like, as much as you can get actual customer feedback on how well this is working, do that too. So, I mean, you can see things from data, which is great. And that's probably, especially if you're dealing with like a more volume-y space, like what you have to work with. Um, but when you launch something new, if you're in like an MVP kind of state and you, and you wanna know how effective things are, um, get with your customers, like talk to them. And like, you know, if you see a customer that just like ran, like just killed it, right? Like they just got in, did all the stuff they were supposed to do. How can you get in touch with them and understand like why that works so well? Yeah. Right. Um, or if you're seeing the opposite where you're like, man, we're just really not seeing it and you can't quite figure it out. Like do you talk to your customers early? Um, Cause they'll tell you. And yeah. so um, I know then that's a hard thing. Like we ask our customers for a lot. I think we all recognize that, um, but getting that like real feedback loop in place um, will make it like the quality will go up much faster. Yeah, I mean, that data can be both quantitative and qualitative, right? Without one or the other, you're only getting part of the story. So excellent point. And then the ultimate goal here is, like we talked about earlier, that the customer is actually getting value out of this. Again, we're not just sending emails or pushing, you know, in-app notifications for funsies, right? We're, we're doing it for the benefit of our customers. And that's the ultimate goal in everything we all are doing all the time, right? Absolutely. All right. Anything else you want to say about goals or outcomes or, or tracking success here? Um, just that you you cut you you walk away with an idea of what those are going to be when your session's over. Um, yeah. If things like like wind up changing a little bit after the fact, just because of your capabilities, like this is another thing. Like eyes get really big when you're planning this stuff. It's like we're gonna look here and we're gonna understand what our customers are doing this, and then you know, depending on your tech stack and how it actually behaves and how much manual effort someone can put into pulling that information is going to drive like what you're able to track and do. Um, and so just, just make sure you're like, this is what we want to know, um, that what success looks like as leading indicators and lagging indicators, um, and then do that work very quickly uh, to understand what is available to you to, to report on. Yeah, what it's going to actually take to be able to measure those things you want to measure. Great call out. Yep. Um, so in this scenario, okay, we've gone through the session, we've drafted up a workflow, which again, I apologize, that's the slide that it's not here for some reason. So I will pull it up after this for everyone. But um, what, what happens now? What, what should people be doing after that, you know, ideally that day in a room together working through this? Uh, so we've probably all been parts of things where there's been like some big amazing brainstorming session or a workshop and then you leave and then you never hear another thing about what happened that day. Um, and so really having someone assigned as the, the directly responsible individual to walk out of the room and collect everything that happened that day. Um, and so generally speaking that, you know, might be somebody who's like taking all the action items, right? So okay, we know a next step is we need to talk with marketing about this. Next step is we need to understand the functionality of this tool. Next step is we need to, blah, like whatever that list is in a spreadsheet or whatever, like it doesn't have to be overly complicated, but make sure someone's like writing down um, kind of what all of those different items are. Um, and then the next piece is like the visualization is really important with this. Um, and so What's most impactful when you're explaining what happened to other people is like having that flow really nicely put together. Um, PowerPoint works great. So there's lots of neat tools for building. Like you can make these things look really good. PowerPoint is kind of nice because everybody has PowerPoint. And so no matter like who you send it to, um, it's, it has that capability and it kind of forces you to, to keep it simple, which is also really good. Um, you know, you can definitely have digital flows and journey maps and all kinds of stuff that are like packed full of information that matters to you. Um, but if you're maybe going to go to your leadership, that's probably not the one that you want to walk in the door with. Um, so 
having someone in that room that is willing to like take the screenshots um, or, you know, take the Miro board or whatever it is that you're using and create a view that you can share internally. Um, and so those two things happening, um, there's a fair amount of project management that's required here. I mean, you really like someone's got to own what follow-up meetings are happening. Um, you know, what is the timeline for moving this? Like, what are the dependencies of this working? So, um, you know, if that's you as the person that is owning the initiative, which often I believe it is, um, you know, make yourself a little project plan, um, assign tasks out to people and just make sure they're following that and you're tracking to your timeline. Um, and just like any other project that you're calling out risks, um, that if something changes because you've learned something new that you're communicating that out, right? So um, those are the critical elements. Um, and the the piece about like the roadshow component, right, um, is A, this sort of thing can really excite people. Like I, this, this is a good opportunity to go and, and, and kind of stretch the CS viewpoint and say like, look at the systemic data-driven um, approach we're taking to our business with the goals of doing this. Um, and this is what we want that to look and feel like for our customers is very powerful. Um, so get gaining advocacy um, around your organization, particularly if you're going to need budget to do what you need to do, um, is getting this in a format that's really shareable um, is a big deal. Yes. Well, that is a great um, lead into, I'm going to find that example that you <laughs> sent me of that thing that can be shared. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second um, and figure out what happened to that slide. Um, while I do that, um, I would love to start having you answer some of the questions that are coming in from our audience. Um, again, if you have a question for Megan, please pop it in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, but we already have quite a few coming through. So um, first one I'll ask you and then I'll go digging for that slide. Okay. Um, have you ever found a need to sell the value of even holding a session like this? Uh, you know, kind of a roadshow before the fact um, to stakeholders, participants, et cetera. And what strategies have you used to get the necessary buy-in to even just have the session, let alone go do the stuff after the session? Yeah. So um, that question was from Mr. Mike Allen, um, who is uh, one of my favorite people. So um, especially if it's going to take a lot of time, Right. So if you're asking for people who are already busy and have other roles and other responsibilities and you want to you know, have people meet in a room for eight hours, that can be difficult to pull off. Um, and so, you know, I've been pretty lucky with, you know, hey, we're coming to design a thing with this outcome. Generally, I've seen a lot of enthusiasm around that. Um, but what I would suggest is just know the impact. So if you're having trouble getting people available or bringing in the right resources to the room, the best chance you have of fixing that problem is to say, here's why I need you. Here's the impact to you being at this session. Here's the outcome that we expect. How do I work with you or you and your leader to make sure that this happens, right? Because um, if that's not well understood and someone's like really meeting heavy, it could just be like, oh my God, I don't have time to sit and for eight hours in a room and not know what that outcome is supposed to be. Um, so the better organized you are ahead of your conversations, like the better that's gonna be. Yes, love it. Um, and this, this next question actually ties in really nicely to that. Can you talk about, you know, do folks typically have a recurring design workshop like this or is it more of a case by case basis for, you know, large feature releases, things like that? How do you typically see that work? I would say if it's bigger, like that's when we're talking about this broader workshopping session, probably what you're going to wind up with um, uh, and what you're going to want to put in place is whatever the cadence is to revisit that, which is generally a little bit of a smaller group, right? So once you've got all the kind of critical components and alignment and sign off and everyone knows it's coming, that's tweak time, right? And so you have the parts of your team that are responsible for checking on the engagement in the emails, right? So, you know, something that we do is we have a reporting that comes out on a regular basis. Like every week, it's like, okay, here's how many people went through the sequence. Here's how many people, um, you know, fully onboarded. Here's how many people did this, right? So if you, it, like the tracking part, I feel like is really important. Um, 
Now that said, if there's a big impact again, so if it's a different segment, if it's new product, um, if you feel like it's something you can't do in a silo because you won't properly address what's needed to deliver that experience, um, and it's time, that's when it's time to revisit what you built. Agreed. You know, it's not necessarily that you're having these on a, you know, a preset regular cadence, right? But you'll, you'll know when it's time for the next one, right? Whether it's for another one of those needs we talked about earlier or time to revisit something you've already built. Um, you'll see the signs that it's time to, to do this again. Yep. Um, okay. So I found that slide and I'm going to show it, but before I do one more question, um, that I think is a good one. We mentioned, um, knowledge bases earlier as a, you know, a resource for our customers. Uh, this question is what would you recommend to organizations who keep their knowledge base content behind a login wall? Is this considered a best practice or should guides or customer articles be accessible to uh, prospects as well as paid customers? This is an interesting question. Super good question. Um, so uh, there's a couple approaches and I don't think there's like a right or a wrong answer yep. to this. So I'm just gonna put that out there right now. The first thing is like what we do is we've kind of got like a two-sided community. Um, so there's like the prospect and customer facing side of the community. And then there's like our knowledge base, right? So because we're thought leadership, like we're big, thought leader in the ethics and compliance space, yeah. it's really important for us to have like a lot of content and a lot of information um, available to people beyond our customers. Um, and it's something we take a lot of pride in. Um, you know, our, our show, like our, our um, like converge shows are only half our users. Like it's a really broad space. So for us, there's a, there's always a lot of conversation around like what is out in the open versus what is behind a login. Um, we do have our knowledge base information behind a login. Um, so you have to be a customer in order to access it. Um, but I know there are other companies that have that stuff out there. Like I wanna say GitLab, maybe HubSpot. There are, cus there, are, there are really smart companies out there that are like, we're just gonna put our stuff everywhere. Our trainings everywhere, how our software works is out in the open. I think if you're really mature and all of that content is really good and all of it is really accurate and all of it is engaging, that's a time to start thinking about it. Cause really what you're demonstrating to people that are not customers is how like organized you are and how easy it will be for them to and to really like let people explore. Um, so I would say if you're like, if you're a mature organization in terms of your knowledge base and you have good um, hygiene of your knowledge base and you have a good branding within your knowledge base, that is probably more possible is to have it kind of open for everybody. Yep. And sometimes there are certain articles that are available to everybody and certain ones that are gated, yep. right? It doesn't have to be all or nothing either. It can be sort of a pick and choose thing, um, which I think is a, a good thing to consider. Totally. Um, okay. So I am going to share that slide that we talked about, that this is a real example of a workflow, right? A touch point map that Megan and her team have created um, and are, are planning on, on using, or you tell me where you are in the process, but. Okay. Awesome. So this is a, there's a lot more with this, but I wasn't going to come with like a whole packet of stuff. So what I wanted to show is how simple this view can be, right? Um, and this is, and this is like impactful and really easy for people to digest when you're, when you're like enabling other teams, let's say, right? So um, this is that self-start flow um, at some point, at some iteration as we were building this out. Um, and one of the things that was really important was we needed to enable the sales team to be able to talk about this onboarding experience with new customers that were coming on board. And so we want to give like that team, our team, um, a way to talk about it so that it makes a lot of sense. Um, and this is just a really simple way of like, okay, on day one um, is a welcome email, right? And that comes from our EVP of CS, right? Like that's not coming from an alias, it's coming from a person. Um, 
And then we're creating an instance, right? So there's like Marley was talking about like front of stage, back of stage. It's like, okay, touch point, customer facing, email goes out on the back end while that's happening is we're gonna stand up their instance in the software. And then the next step is like, hey, customer, your instance is set up, your lines are live, and here's all of the different things that you can do now um, that all of that has happened. And so on the right, you know, as you see those stacks of like the four things, like those are the different purchase options, right? So um, if it kind of goes from like most simple to most complicated. So if people are adding on additional capabilities, we're starting to introduce more flows to support those additional capabilities. And so this really walks you through like no matter what they've bought, here's what that's going to look and feel like. Um, and then as you see, like on the back end, it's the inbound, like how are we handling inbound? So we have an alias so people can reach out to our technical consultants. We don't want our customers to feel like they're on an island. So there's very clearly a step in that pink box that says like, okay, they're in the middle of doing all this stuff. They have questions. Here's a place where they can write. Um, again, you want to talk about like capacity planning and resources. This is really important. If you want to have someone um, uh, inter like, I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, if you if you want to have that positive experience and you want to have like any one-on-one -on -one interaction, somebody's going to need to staff that. Someone's going to need to be there to answer those questions. Um, and is that going to pull away from other work they're doing or do you need somebody that's new? Um, and then how do you want to wrap it up, right? So the next step after this then is like, well, then what, right? Like, so this thing happens. Well, what's the next part and what's the next journey? Um, but yeah, this is just a very simple example of like, of just a PowerPoint slide that you can pull out of a session like this to illustrate, um, what it is that you're putting together and proposing. Yes, no. And that's so important, right? And this is like we talked about earlier, you know, that, that road show that you're probably going to need to go on afterwards. This is the type of thing that you want to bring and show, you know, whoever you need to get that buy-in from, right? Yep. Hey, this is our plan not too complicated to look at, right? It's relatively simple to visually see and it's laid out in a way that, okay, I can look at this. And even if I wasn't part of the workshop, I get the gist of what you're trying to tell me here. Um, so I think that's really important to keep in mind too. And, and then as the deeper you get, right? So what this turns into is then there's a slide, there's a slide for each and every one of these touch points. It's like, this is what the content looks like. This is what the customer's doing. This is how we're doing it, right? So each one of these boxes has a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, so once you kind of have sign off on the approach is when you can start digging into more of the how, right? So these are the tools that we're gonna use and um, this is the information that we have and this is the experience we want our customers to have at each and every one of these touch points. Yes. Well, with that, I think we have come to the end of our time together. So Megan, I just, any um, you know closing thoughts you wanna, you wanna share before we wrap up? Um, just don't be afraid to do this um, and make to make this a step in the process if you are going to launch any sort of digital sequences, like bring a lot of, bring the people in, plan for it, have a tool to work with, um, and then really know what those next steps are. I mean, that's like table stakes stuff, but it's so, so important. So um, and just reiterating those parts, but I, thank you so much for having me. I could talk about this stuff all day long. So um, appreciate the time, everybody. Yes, thank you all for joining us, Megan. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, everyone out there, I hope you will join me next week as I moderate uh, the Turn Zero webinar uh, to reveal our annual customer success leadership study results. Um, in the follow-up email with this recording, we'll send you information about that. And join us next month for Customer Success Unlocked, uh, when we'll have a very special guest host, ESG's CEO, Michael Harnum, will be hosting our session next month. So keep an eye out for details in your inbox coming soon. Thank you all.